And we are live on Facebook. Thank you everyone for joining us this morning. It's my great pleasure to have a great friend and mentor of the New Jersey Constitutional Republicans, my good friend, Mr. William Bill Federer. Bill, thank you for joining us again. Hey, great to be with you, JR. And of course, uh, Mr. Federer has been very busy um, as usual traveling and uh, he's become a prolific author of many great books. We featured a couple of them and today we're gonna to feature another one. Um, this book was uh, published last year, Bill, and it's called uh, Socialism, The Real History from Plato to the Present. Bill is gonna give us a, a PowerPoint presentation, which is gonna be very, very informative. And I was just uh, mentioning to Bill before uh, we went on live that uh, if we had promoted, if the Constitutional Republicans had promoted this book throughout the uh, campaign season this year, um, perhaps Phil Murphy may not have been reelected because you're clearly going to see um, in Bill's presentation um, the really the many similarities of Phil Murphy's ideological, political ide ideology is associated and very, very closely tied to socialism. So Bill, thank you for joining me and let's get the uh, presentation underway. And um, if anyone is out there would like to take the opportunity to share this video and to call others to watch, please do because it's gonna be very informative. Okay, Bill, it's all yours. Well, thank you, JR. And for those interested, this is from a book, it's called Socialism, the Real History from Plato to the Present, and the subtitle is How the Deep State Capitalizes on Crises to Consolidate Control. And yes. I um, have a, a, a PowerPoint presentation that um, I can uh, go through for uh, our, our purposes here. And um, let me make sure I can Get it working. My website's <clears throat> my website's AmericanMinute.com, and I send out a daily history email. So, <clears throat> socialism—the first one that came up with the idea of everybody owning everything in common was Plato. He lived 380 BC in Athens, and he talks in passing of Atlantis, this highly structured civilization on an island that sinks in the sea. Whether it existed or not, he thought that it did, uh, probably about eight centuries before he existed. So he lived 380 BC. This would have been way before him. But there is an island in the Mediterranean called Santorini, and it's what's left of a volcano. And it's a beautiful tourist attraction that I went to in college. Anyway, so Plato's Atlantis is a highly structured civilization, and he considered democracy an unstructured society. That most means people crossing means rule. So in a democracy, the people rule. And the chief characteristic of a democracy is tolerance. Everybody tolerates each other. It's wonderful. He says the state is like a bazaar, which you can buy anything, like a piece of embroidery with the greatest variety of human natures. Such as democracy, a pleasing, lawless, various sort of government, a charming form of government full of variety and disorder. And then he says that the manner of life is that of Democrats. Everyone, every man does what is right in their own eyes, right? So they're tolerating all kinds of behaviors. And uh, then they tolerate disrespect in the home. The father gets accustomed to descend to the level of his son and fear him. And the son having no shame or fear of his parents. And then they tolerate disrespect in the classroom. The teacher fears and flatters his students and the students despise their masters and tutors. And then they tolerate uh, irresponsibility in their finances and they vote to take the city money and spread it around. Now the treasury is empty. Then they vote to take the money from the rich. He says the leaders are deprived of their estates and distribute them amongst the people. And then he says they tolerate immorality and the young man passes into freedom and libertinism of useless and unnecessary pleasures there is no conceivable folly or crime not accepting incest or any other unnatural union he is part of company with all shame yes that's what he's talking about and the better fact a study was done by oxford anthropologist jd unwin in title sex and culture published a book 1934 and he studied 80 civilizations over 5,000 years and saw trends. And one of the trends was that loosening of sexual restraints always leads to civilizational decline. 
And he said civilizations go through four stages. The first is a period of pain and poverty. They go through war, famine, they make it through, then they work hard and they become productive. Then they pitch in and they work together and they become patriotic. And uh, eventually they reach prosperity and then they want to enjoy their prosperity and they get a little promiscuous, indulgent, undisciplined laws weakened and they get conquered by the next rising civilization. Uh, it's um, very similar to an athlete when he's young, he's disciplined and focused and watches his diet and he exercises really hard. And then finally, uh, he gets that championship and he rules for a couple seasons. And then he uh, gets a little lazy, doesn't exercise as much and maybe eats some fatty foods. And he, in his mind, still thinks he's the tough guy, but he gets challenged into the ring of competition. He gets the tar knocked out of him because in reality, he's overweight. And so uh, J.D. Unwin even called it a, a sexual marketplace. He says, when women as a whole say nothing happens unless there's a commitment, the guys say whatever it takes and they make the commitment. And then they go out and be productive to provide for their wife. And then little kids appear. And the guy has a new uh, phenomenon called being protective. And when all the men of the country are productive and protective, rising water floats all boats. The whole country is productive, protective, expansionistic, creative, innovative, uh, militaristic. Um, but when the women as a whole say there does not need to be a commitment, well, water seeks its own level and you'll have a bunch of guys getting pleasure focused and selfish and indulgent. And, and then there's fewer kids born to fill the ranks of the military and right, the whole country eventually gets weakened and then they get conquered by the next rising civilization. Uh, J.D. Unwin says it's irreversible. Once a nation starts going down that path, it's like a snowball again, uh, accumulating momentum. Uh, and now it's yet to see if uh, America can buck that trend. Um, but John Adams writes to Thomas Jefferson, have you ever found in history one single example of a nation thoroughly corrupted that was afterwards restored to virtue? And without virtue, there can be no political liberty. Will you tell me how mm -hmm. to prevent luxury from producing effeminacy, intoxication, extravagance, vice folly? No effort in favor of virtue is lost. So here he is, Truman said, without a firm moral foundation, freedom degenerates quickly into selfishness and anarchy. So in Athens, they tolerate each other, it's great. Then they tolerate people that are off, then they tolerate people that are a lot off till finally they're tolerating lawlessness. And um, he says that there's uh, random violence and robbing and stealing and no one feels safe. And then they begin to look for someone to fix this unstructured mess. And that's when some governor comes along and he says, I can fix it. I just need some emergency powers. And at first he's all smiles. Plato says, last of all comes the tyrant. When he first appears above ground, he's a protector. He's full of smiles. And he gives you a nice speech and he says, I'm going to take away some of your freedoms, but I'm doing this to protect you. And it's just temporary. But as he begins to consolidate power, it becomes permanent. And if any are suspected of resistance to his authority, he'll have a good pretext for destroying them. And then well, how does a protector begin to change into a tyrant? Plato says he begins to grow unpopular. So what's he talking about? So there's two methods of which tyrants rule, fraud and force. Fraud is that you lie to the people while you're taking away their freedoms. And when they finally wake up and you can't lie to them anymore because they're seeing through it, the only tool left in their toolbox is force. And that's when they begin to use the military to force their agenda. And Plato says, finally standing up in the chariot estate with the reins in his hand, a tyrant absolute. And then having a mob entirely at his disposal, he's not restrained from shedding the blood. So he sends a mob out. And since he's in charge of law and order, he's going to turn the blind eye while this mob goes and destroys his political opponents. Now, Plato says that democracy is doomed to fail because it's based on the people having virtue and people really don't have virtue. If you give them a choice of giving up their life or giving up their virtue, they'll always give up their virtue to save their life. And uh, now ancient Israel, their experiment of ruling themselves without a king lasted a little longer because they had a big magnet in the sky called God. And people were virtuous because they were accountable to this God. But Athens did not have that. By Plato's time, Athens had a bunch of fickle deities that nobody believed in anyway. And uh, so Plato says that uh, if anyone was born 
that truly had virtue, the world would crucify him. This is what he writes, 380 BC. If a truly just man lived, let him die as he lived. I might add that the just man will be scourged, racked, bound, and will at last be crucified. Anyway, Plato concluded, since um, democracy is doomed to fail, the best you can hope for is a nice tyrant. He called him a philosopher king. And now let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Even if you can find a nice tyrant, a philosopher king, he does not live forever. And as good as he may be, at some point, he's going to die and pass that power on to some son or grandson that's a lousy ruler, but yet likes his job and will become oppressive. And so that is the dilemma. The biblical example is Joseph in Egypt. He's a godly man. He concentrates power into the hands of the Pharaoh. And what did that particular Pharaoh do with the concentrated power? He fed the children of Israel, gave him the best land to Goshen, gave him jobs taking care of his cattle. But then there was a new Pharaoh that did not know Joseph. And he used all that concentrated power to oppress the children of Israel, make them slaves, and even throw their sons in the Nile River. So again, that's the dilemma. You get your favorite politician in, and he wants to concentrate power because he wants to do good more efficiently. But then at some point, it's passed over to someone of the other party, and they want to use that concentrated power oppressively. Uh, so Plato says that because democracy is doomed to fail, the best you can hope for is a nice tyrant. He called him a philosopher king, and he's the head of gold. So he can be treated a little extra special because he's the one calling the shots. And we tried the democracy didn't work. So he's the best you can hope for. So, so he, can, he can live above the crowd. And he has his helpers, his administrators, and his military. They're the arms and chest of silver. They're carrying out the, the head of gold's will. And together, they make up the ruling class. And everyone else is the abdomen of iron and bronze. They are the ruled class. So socialism is a structured society of a ruling class and a ruled class. And uh, now the ruling class, they're above the law. They're politically connected. They're supported by the commoners. They can do special things like, like getting their hair styled when nobody else can. All right, there's Nancy Pelosi there in San, San Francisco. Right. Now, the ruled class, uh, everyone is provided for. Yeah, that's great. But no one owns anything. Everything's held in common, but it's the ruling class that, that decides who gets what. And so it's the saying, he who holds the purse strings has the power. Mm -hmm. So great. Everybody's equal. Everybody gets this. Everybody's equal. But somebody's in the actual position of carrying this out. And they are going to be tempted to want to slip a little extra to their family and friends on the side. And they're going to be tempted to want to withhold something from someone they don't like. And before you know it, it gets discretionary. And uh, people say, well, socialism, isn't that, you know, everybody, you know, is, is equal. It's like, okay, let's ask a question. Who lives in the nice house and who lives in the dumpy house? Uh, somebody in the government dictates those things. Well, whoever ultimately dictates those things is the dictator. So every attempt at everybody owning everything equally always turns into a dictatorship. Now, in this right. Plato's society, there's no families. The government actually decides who gets to have children. And then the government takes the children away from the families, brings them into the city where the kids are socialized. It's a process of getting them to give up their family's values and just learn how to serve the ruling class. Plato explained that when the true philosopher kings are born in a state, they will set in order their own city. They will take possession of the children who will be unaffected by the habits of their parents. These they will train in their own habits and laws. And then these children will be taught lies, noble lies. Plato said, we want one single grand lie, which will be believed by everybody. And the lies help the ruling class to stay in power. And since uh, that's the best you can hope for, uh, it's okay for them to lie. That's their justification. So Plato's perfect society on Atlantis inspired in 1516 Sir Thomas More's Utopia. It's actually island of Utopia. Utopia means nowhere. It's a fictitious island off the coast of South America. And it's written as a Greek dialogue, like 
Socrates never wrote anything down. It was Plato that recorded the conversations. And so this uh, island of Utopia is written as a dialogue with a traveler named Hythlodeus, which means peddler of nonsense. So we have the island of nowhere told to us by the peddler of nonsense. And like Atlantis, it's highly structured. There's an upper class with rulers and the lower class commoners. And there is free health care on Utopia, free identical clothing. Everyone receives free welfare. There's free meals and monastic communal dining halls. Everyone lives in identical three-story public housing. There's no locks on any doors. There's no private property. All property and goods are stored in a communal warehouse. There are no taverns, no alehouses, no coffee houses, no places for private gatherings, no privacy. Everyone is tracked everywhere you go with an internal passport. If you're caught without it, it's a lifetime of slavery. All right, this is 1516 when he writes this. The government decides everyone's careers that you have to work for the rest of your life. There are no families on the island of Utopia. And the government decides who gets to have kids. It's very, childbearing is regulated. Like China's one child policy or Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, no woman shall have a legal right to bear a child without a permit. Matter of fact, a WND article uh, recently, a politician proposed that parents um, have a license to raise their own children. So the island of Atlantis in uh, yeah, Plato's time uh, inspired Sir Thomas More's Island of Utopia. By the way, he wrote it as a veiled criticism of Henry VIII. He was the king who switched from, Protest from Catholic to Protestant, and those that didn't follow him immediately, like Sir Thomas More, were killed. So Sir Thomas More was killed by Henry VIII. Um, Sir Francis Bacon, in 1626, he wrote New Atlantis. This is a direct reference to Plato's Atlantis. And New Atlantis is a fictitious island in the South Pacific. There's a ruling class, there's commoner class, a little more scientific careers because Francis Bacon helped start the scientific revolution, but the government dictates everything. Someone wrote a satire on this that, that you're familiar with. It's Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, right? Here's Gulliver washed up on an island and finds out it's highly structured with this ridiculous ruling class that wants to control everything. And then the ruled class that has to just work their jobs their whole life. Someone, why is this important? Because it was around this time that the pilgrims came to America and the pilgrims were originally a company colony. And uh, they did not have money. And so they approached investors in England who formed the London Company and these investors wrote the bylaws. And so the investors look back to Plato, Sir Thomas More, Sir Francis Bacon. And the bylaws say all profits and benefits that are got by trade, traffic, trucking, working, fishing, or any other means shall remain in ye common stock. And all are to have their meat, drink, and apparel and all provision out of ye common stock. And William Bradford said they tried it and almost starved. He says, and William Bradford is the governor of the pilgrims. He said the failure of that experiment of communal service, which was tried for several years by good and honest men, proves the emptiness of the theory of Plato and other ancients applauded by some of latter times. I just think it's amazing that here the pilgrims knew they were trying to live out this theoretical Plato's perfect society. Right. So you have Plato, Sir Thomas More, and you know, others, and they're like all guys sitting around a table theorizing, and the pilgrims actually try to live it out, and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. William Bradford says that the taking away of private property and possession of it in community would make a state happy and flourishing, as if they were wiser than God. For in this mm -hmm. instance, community of property was found to breed much confusion and discontent and retard much employment, which would have been to the general benefit for the young men who were most able and fit for service, objected to being forced to spend their time and strength in working for other men's wives and children without any recompense. The strong man or the resourceful man had no more share of food, clothes, et cetera, than the weak man who was not able to do a quarter what the other could. This was thought injustice. 
the aged and graver men who were ranked and equalized in labor, food, clothes, et cetera, with the humbler and younger ones, thought it some indignity and disrespect to them. As for men's wives who were obliged to do service for other men, such as cooking, washing their clothes, etc., they considered it a kind of slavery, and many husbands would not brook it or allow it. Bradford goes on, let none argue that this is due to human failing rather than to this communistic plan of life in itself. I answer that God in his wisdom saw that another plan of life was fitter for them. So they began to consider how to raise more corn, obtain a better crop, so they might not continue to endure the misery of want. After much debate, the governor with the chief among them allowed each man to plant corn for his own household. What a novel idea. So every family was assigned a parcel of land. This was very successful. It made all hands very industrious so that much more corn was planted than otherwise would have been by any means and gave far better satisfaction. The women now went willingly into the field and took their little ones with them to plant corn. While before they would allege weakness and inability and to have compelled them would have been thought great oppression. So here we have this theoretical Plato, Sir Thomas More, Sir Francis Bacon. We have the pilgrims actually trying to live it out and fails. They scrap it and go back to giving everybody their own plot of land. Now, wasn't the early church socialist? Actually, the early church was the early church. Socialism is counterfeit early church. And the differences between the word voluntary and involuntary and church and government. So the early believers voluntarily sold their land and laid the money at the feet of the apostles for the church to distribute. They didn't have their land taken away and then be forced to involuntarily lay the money at the feet of Pilate for the Roman government to distribute. So voluntary versus involuntary is sort of a big thing with God. It's sort of the whole reason he made us, right? Everything else follows instinct or laws of planetary motion, laws of gravity, right? Uh, humans have free will. And so when Moses is building the tabernacle in the wilderness. He says, everybody whose heart is moved uh, would bring cloth and jewels and gold to build it. And when David is raising money for his to set aside for Solomon to later build the temple, David says, I'm going to give so many thousand talents of gold. And he turns to all the leaders in Israel says, what are you guys going to give? And then they give a bunch of thousands of talents of gold, but it, it's all willingly. And David says in a prayer, oh Lord, we're just giving back to you what you gave to us, right? But it's all giving. It's all a gift. It's not forced. So in the Bible, the children of Israel go into the promised land, and every family is given land. Sort of easy to know this because it's called the promised what? The promised land. And if you own land, you can accumulate stuff. The Bible called that being blessed. And you can be moved upon in your heart to give away some of your stuff. The Bible call that charity. Now, Lenin said socialism is a transition phase between capitalism to communism. And Marx, Karl Marx says communism can be summed up in one sentence, abolition of private property. So if you do not own any property, how can you give anything away? How can you give away what you don't have? What are you going to steal? from somebody now you're a thief right you've broken the law no god entrusts you with stuff and then you have the opportunity to manifest in this physical world what spiritually is in your heart uh, now didn't jesus teach socialism well let's look at this parable of the talents or minus he uh, gives one guy five multiplies it to ten another guy gets four multiplies it another guy gets one and buries it and uh the one guy comes and says, sir, here's your mind. I've kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. And his master replied, you wicked servant. He said to those standing by, take his mind away from him and give it to the one who has 10 minds. And they said, sir, he already has 10. He replied, I tell you, everyone who has more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. So Jesus says, the hand of the diligent shall you know, bear rule. That's what the proverb said. And so the idea is you work hard, you get blessed. And then what do you do with your blessings? You have more to give away. You have more to be charitable with. If Jesus were a socialist, he would have forcibly taken away the, the 10 talents from that one guy or 10 minus and redistributed it equally. 
But no, he said, look, you worked hard, you get it. And now you have the opportunity to be more generous. There is a confusion as to the role of government. In the Bible, God, God clearly gives commands to five groups. Individuals, family, business, church, government. The commands of the individual are, uh, among other things, take care of the poor. The commands to the family are mostly relational. Husbands, love your wives. Children, submit to your parents. Commands to the business are do an honest day's work, and employers don't hold back the wages. The church is definitely commanded to take care of the poor, and immediately they did feeding orphans and widows, and then started medical clinics and schools and hospitals and so forth. There's no command for the church to take care of the poor. The command to the, excuse me, no command for the government to take care of the poor. The command to the government is the shortest, protect the innocent, punish the guilty. There's no command for the government to uh, be involved in health care. There's no command for the government to be involved in education. What's happened is the government has usurped the church's role. And uh, there's a quote from James Madison, considered the architect of the Constitution. He said, charity is no part of the legislative duty of the government. And Davy Crockett was a congressman, and there was a, a person that had given a lot to the founders, and their house had gotten burnt, and Congress, they were going to vote to bail this person out and give him money. And Davy Crockett said, no. He says, Congress has not the power to appropriate this money as an act of charity. Every member on this floor knows it. We have the right as individuals to give away as much as a bunch of our own money as we please in charity. But as members of Congress, we have no right to appropriate a dollar of public money as charity. Coolidge says, it does not follow that because something ought to be done, the national government ought to do it. It's like, we need to take care of the poor. Yes, we do, but it's not the government's job. We need to take care of the immigrants. Yes, we do, but it's not the government's job. We need to teach the poor kids. Yes, we do, but it's not the government's job. We need to take care of everybody's health care. Yes, but it's not the government's job. And historically, the church has always responded to these things, very similar to the way the church acts on the mission field. You go to a poor third world country and missionaries show up. What do they do? They dig wells. They start schools, they start hospitals, they start medical clinics, they start all this stuff, it, right? The government's job is just to keep the peace, to punish the guilty and reward the, the, the um, innocent. Right. Gerald Bill, Ford said- Bill, Bill, just let me interject there if I could. Um, the purpose of government, we talk about all the time. And of course, the Declaration of Independence uh, clearly identifies what the purpose of government is, and that's to secure are secure the people's rights, which are life, number one, um, and then the giving people liberty to make their own decisions, to earn their own living, to own their own property, and the pursuit of happiness, which is something that's left to the individual to do, not for the government to dictate what that happiness should be or is. It's up to the individual to do that. And of course, we know that the individual will thrive if he is practicing morality, if he is reading the Bible, if he's keeping the commandments of God. But the purpose of government is clearly to secure the person and their property, and that is it. And it's funny that it's not funny, but it's it's ironic that you use Calvin Coolidge, who we consider really to be the last constitutional Republican president we had. Of course, after that, we had the most, uh, we had Herbert Hoover, and then we had Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who thought that all of these different uh, there was an expansion of rights that were given the people in um, Franklin Roosevelt's address in 1944, expanding rights that people should be able to go on vacation, that they should have a great, good job, that they should be given education. All these other expanded, uh, essentially, the Bill of Rights. But yet Coolidge was saying, listen, what the, the government isn't supposed to be doing everything for you, except, as you say, protecting the people and administering justice, uh, which is punishment for crimes committed against others and punishment for those who steal the property of others. So it's very, very interesting, um, as this whole presentation is, um, that we talk about uh, the purpose of government and just, just, just reiterates what we always uh, tell the pe people. Amen. That's great. Well, Gerald, this is Ger a great quote. Gerald Ford, said, people say, why did you expand that program and spend more federal money? 
I look them in the eye and say, do you realize that a government big enough to give us everything we want is a government big enough to take from us everything we have? You know, what if older fish could pass the history on to younger fish to stay away from shiny things dangling in the water? But they can't. So every new generation of younger fish sees this shiny hook and they're attracted to it and caught. Socialism is a shiny thing dangling in the water. Free food, free clothes, free education, free welfare, free, free, free. Free is attractive. But there's a hook there. You're giving up control of your life. Um, now, when the church helps someone, it's called disinterested benevolence. You help them for no other reason than wanting to help them, and hopefully they'll get better off and help the next needy person that comes along and the body of Christ can grow. When the government helps anybody, it's always an exchange for something, right? You're in Egypt, you need food, the government comes along, we'll give you food, but it's an exchange for your cattle, your lives, your boats, control over your life. And again, whoever holds the purse strings has the power. If the government's going to give you something, right, they can decide who gets it and who doesn't. And when the church helps, it's always personal. The giver experiences the joy of the Lord of being used to help someone in their time of need. And the recipient experiences the love of God through a real person and is grateful to God. And they begin to have a relationship and they grow. Whenever the government helps anybody, it's always impersonal. You don't know whose pocket that money came out of that went into your welfare check. And instead of being grateful, the recipient begins to view it as a debt that is owed to them. And they become irate if it's delayed or discontinued. And then an interesting phenomenon, over time, the recipient loses self-esteem. They see other people working mm -hmm. and being successful. And deep down, they feel like bad about themselves. And they want to channel that negative feeling somewhere. And they end up channeling it and blaming the entity that's making them feel bad the very government that's helping them out right they end up hating the government giving them free stuff it's a very strange phenomenon now the pilgrims uh they switch from company to covenant what's the difference from involuntary to voluntary instead of an involuntary system that says everything's owned in common everything everybody gets their stuff out of there and and they don't really have a say it's just set up it goes to a covenant where you voluntarily take care of your neighbor and uh, the covenant comes from ancient israel that first 400 years out of egypt and it's this idea that you get rights and blessings from god and you help take care of your neighbor because you are accountable to god Jesus said, whatever you do to the least of these, my brethren, you've done unto me. Now, they taught Hebrew at Yale and Harvard. They looked back to that first 400-year period of Israel out of Egypt. It's called the Hebrew Republic. And the Puritan scholars at this time were called Christian Hebraists. And they actually studied the Jerusalem Talmud and Mamanides, who was a famous rabbi, and the Torah and all the Talmud and all these different Jewish writings, and they're fascinated by how you could have a government with millions of people and no king for that first 400 years before Saul. And I talk about this in my book, Socialism, a little bit more in a book called Who Was the King in America? But for the sake of those watching that have not seen it, I'll go through it quickly. So the first, so around 1400 BC, Israel comes out of Egypt, and for 400 years, no king. It's a total anomaly that you don't appreciate until you study all the rest of the world at this time. You had 2,000 years of Egyptian pharaohs, you know, Chinese emperors, Indian maharajas. You had kings Ag of Ashan, Germanic tribal chieftains, African chieftains. Everything's chiefs and kings. And when Israel comes out of Egypt for, for 400 years, there's no king. And the law specifically said there's no respect of persons in judgment. Rich or poor, everyone's to be treated the same. Male, female, made in the image of the creator. You see, wherever there's a king, if you're friends with the king, you're more equal. You're not friends with the king, you're less equal. You're an enemy of the king, you're dead, or you're a slave. Wherever you have kings on top, you have slaves on the bottom. But for ancient Israel, that first 400 years out of Egypt, no king. And it's the beginning of the concept of equality, that everyone you see is equal to you. Israel had tolerance. Here they were worshiping the one true God, and they never felt compelled to force anyone to worship the one true God. Right? They didn't say, get your lamb and drag it to the temple. Ancient Israel was the first nation with private land ownership. 
wherever there's a king, you never really own the land. It's always conditional of you staying on the nice side of the king. You cross the king, he'll take away the land and kill you. But in ancient Israel, the land was permanently titled to each family. Again, and you own land, you can accumulate stuff. The Bible call that being blessed. And you can give away some of your stuff voluntarily. That's called charity. Ancient Israel had no police. Everyone was taught the law. Everyone helped enforce the law. It was like everybody was deputized. It's like a mom watching a bunch of neighborhood kids. She has no problem correcting somebody else's kid. In ancient Israel, everybody corrected everybody else. Israel, even the children were taught the law. Remember, Plato talked about taking the kids away from the parents and then bringing them into the city and being indoctrinated. Uh, so the whole battle is who gets to teach the kids? Who gets to teach the next generation? And, um, and so the, the other side wants to put their malware and spyware and corrupted file software on these little kids' brains. And uh, we, it's our job to put God's behavioral software onto their brains, right? Love your enemies. And um, so uh, Israel was the first nation with no standing army. You have a king, he has an army to enforce his will. In ancient Israel, when um, every man was in the militia and they were armed with a sword upon their thigh and they were ready at a moment's notice to defend their family and their community. Israel had no prisons every, uh, when a crime was committed. Uh, it's not, not like Egypt where Joseph was in prison for several years. In Israel, when a crime was committed, you got the accused uh, and you took the elders of the city and you had the trial right then. Israel had a bureaucracy-free welfare system. So in Egypt, people were selling their souls to the Pharaoh for a bag of grain. But in Israel, when uh, you harvested your field, you left the gleanings, the corners for the poor people to pick through, like Ruth. This way, the poor were taken care of without some political leader collecting everything and doling it back out to those who can vote for him, right? Israel had a system of honesty. God hates unjust weights and measures, became the basis for commerce. You could trust people in business. And then Israel got to choose their own leaders. Moses spake unto the children of Israel, how can I myself alone bear your burden? Take you, wise men, and understanding, and known among your tribes, and I'll make them rulers over you. So you know the people that hate covetousness. They're honest. You just can't bribe them. Those are the people that you put forward. And Moses says, okay, I'll, I'll recognize this person as the leader. It was an election process. Anyone could be raised up into leadership. There was no royal bloodline at this point. So Gideon was raised up in the Bill, leadership. Bill, you Bill, just let me interject. So we see here the beginning of representative government with the nation of Israel. This was the beginning of people representing their constituents, their neighbors, their fellow citizens. This was the genesis of representative government right here. It was, Moses yes. And yeah, it wasn't some, this first 400 year period, there, there was not a king. There was not the king sending his representative to a town saying, okay, I'm here to take charge. No, it was every town got to choose their own elders. And then they would elect representatives to go to the tribal meeting. And then they would elect representatives to go to the Sanhedrin, the, the 70 elders of, the, of all of Israel. And um, But here's Deborah, a woman becomes a national leader in Israel, not because she's related to royalty, she just knows the law. She's honest. The reputation spreads. She sits under a tree and people make their way all the way across the country for her to hear their case and tell them what the law says. Where else in the world at this time could a woman become a national leader if not related to royalty? And so Harvard President Samuel Langdon gives an address to the New Hampshire Convention where they were ratifying the Constitution in 1788. And Langdon says the Israelites may be considered as a pattern to the world in all ages of government on Republican principles, from abject yeah. slavery, a mere mob, to a well-regulated nation under laws far superior to what any other nation could boast. So think of it, they go from 400 years of slaves, they can't even read, and suddenly they get downloaded this complete package system and it worked for 400 years. It wasn't like Athens or Rome where they did trial and error, a little bit of this, a little, no, this was a complete package system. and. Ancient Israel was the first nation that could read. Sumeria had over 1,500 cuneiform characters, but it was just for kings and scribes. 
Egypt had 3,000 hieroglyphic characters just for the pharaohs in the upper class. Only 1% of Egypt could read. Reading and writing was the scribes' secret knowledge. They kept the hieroglyphs complicated on purpose as job security. China had 10,000 characters, but only for court records. It was only the upper class, the deep state that knew what was going on. Everybody else was un uneducated. They're easier to control when they're ignorant. Little of that in America prior to the Civil War. Frederick Douglass, the Republican advisor to Abraham Lincoln, wrote in his biography of growing up on a Southern Democrat plantation as a slave in the Slave master's sister-in-law was teaching him the alphabet and her husband comes in and yells at her and says, don't you dare teach slaves to read. It's illegal. They'll, they'll be able to forge documents and run away. Frederick Douglass says that was the first sermon that convinced me that I wanted to learn how to read. Anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss wrote, ancient writing's main function was to facilitate the enslavement of other human beings. Again, it was just the deep state. They knew what was going on and everybody else was in the dark. When Moses comes down the mountain, he does not just have the law. He has the law in a 22 character alphabet. First letter's Aleph, second letter Beth. It is so easy to learn. Kids could learn it. Ancient Israel is the first literate populace on planet earth, right? So the people were taught the law that gave them individual rights and individual blessings, and they could read the law for themselves so they could maintain their rights. Eupolemus. Bill, 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 just let me interject there because the simplicity, God gave us the alphabet, gave Moses the alphabet. The children can read the law and understand the law from, from, their, from the very beginning, from the youth. And that's exactly what the founders intended legislation and lawmaking to be when they created our, um, our federal republic. Um, it, law should be easy for people to understand and read. And of course, we see um, Obamacare, and we see Don uh, Frank, and we see all these 2,400. We see this infrastructure bill. Uh, this runs contrary to the uh, expectations the founders had in making law. Law making should be very, very easy so that even young children can understand it and comprehend it. And this is an exact example of that precedent. I, yes, definitely. Now, if you think of power as a spectrum, one side's total government, the other side's no government. Total government power concentrates like a black hole, right, uh, into the hands of one person, and they rule through fear. But the other side is no government. That would be anarchy, unless the people were taught the law. And so um, I was thinking of a way of explaining this. Uh, everyone has an iPhone with GPS. And you can get from point A to point B just by you all by yourself in the car with your GPS. Imagine if there was a behavioral app that could tell you how to act in real time, right? So it uh, senses your blood pressure and your heart rate and sees you're about to lose your temper. And it says, alert, don't lose your temper, that person. And then it sees you eyeing something on the table and it knows your bank account's low and it sees you've been Google searching this item. And then it geo position sees that nobody else is around and it runs the algorithm and it says you're thinking of stealing that and it says alert alert don't steal right so imagine a behavioral right. app and the levites were the computer geeks that help you to download the app right you go to apple store google play line up online precept upon precept punch this button here and that one there and um and so the big question is why would you follow it what would motivate you to follow this behavioral app, this internal law. Ancient mm -hmm. Israel had the key motivating piece. And there is a God who is watching everyone. He wants mm -hmm. you to be fair and he's going to hold you accountable in the future. All right? So you're about to steal something. Nobody's around. And then you think, uh, God is watching me. I'm being tracked by God, right? Uh, and this God wants me to be fair, doing to others as you to them doing to you. And he's going to hold me accountable sometime in the future. Maybe I should hesitate stealing. Mm. And it creates something in your head called the conscience. If everybody in the country really believes this, you can maintain complete order with no police, maximum mm. liberty. And um, now God That's knew right. that the... God knew the Israelites would sin and rather than them walk around the rest of their life with a guilty conscience, 
Once a year, they had the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, where everyone's sins were forgiven for the past year, and they got to start off the new year with a clean slate. Mm -hmm. And obviously, that's foreshadowing Jesus. Ronald Reagan said, without God, there's no virtue because there's no prompting of the conscience. If there's no God, where do the laws come from? Uh, a bunch of old white men. <laughs> I follow them. <laughs> well, some will, as long right. as it's the in thing to do and socially acceptable. But, uh, but if not, they're going to start yielding to their selfish side. And so what happened with ancient Israel? Uh, they stopped teaching the law. They stop teaching about God, mm. it turns into chaos, mm. and then the rubber band snapped back into the hands of the king. And you said they didn't, they stopped teaching the law. Yeah, remember Eli, the high priest, his own sons are sleeping with women in the very tent where the Ark of the Covenant was. And mm. then you have a Levite with a graven image in the house of a guy named Micah. Then the tribe of Dan comes along and takes the graven image and tells this Levite, come along with us, you can be a priest to our whole tribe. And you're scratching your head thinking, what's this Levite doing with the graven image? Isn't that one of the commandments? You're not supposed to have them. And then there's a story of a Levite with a concubine. The law says the Levite's to marry a virgin of his own tribe. Here he is with the woman not even married to. And uh, they're traveling at a house and it's surrounded by sodomites. And something about that behavior that appears at the last stages of a people ruling themselves. Remember Plato? Yes. Right? Talked about uh, that... Um, the young man gives into libertinism of useless and unnecessary pleasures. There's no conceivable folly or crime, not accepting incest or any other unnatural union. Remember J.D. Unwin, that uh, Oxford anthropologist that said that sexual promiscuity always precedes the collapse of a civilization. And so here we have this sexual uh, casting off of restraints and the poor concubines raped to death. And by the time you're grossed out with the story, you read this line. Every man did that which was right in their own eyes. And that's very similar to what yes. uh, Plato had uh, written uh, about uh, some 600 years later in, in Athens, that the manner of life is that of Democrats. Every man does what's right in their own eyes. And so it turns into an unstructured chaos in ancient Israel. Mm. And then everybody says, we want someone to come along and fix. We, we need some governor to come along and fix this mess. And that's when they get Saul. And... Um, when they uh, Samuel the prophet cries and the Lord tells him yes. they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not mm. reign over them. So they gave up their own being involved and they surrendered to this government and, um, and Saul ruled as a tyrant. One story, mm -hmm. he was pouting that his son, Jonathan became friends with David and he turns to his soldiers and he goes, you soldiers know about this, but none of you are telling me about it because, you know, you don't care about me. And this Doeg the Edomite says, King, I care. I saw David go to this town. The priest gave him some bread and the sword of Goliath that was stored there. And Saul says, bring those priests to me. They show up. He turns to uh, his men. He says, kill them. The men hesitate. And Doeg says, I'll kill them. And goes out there and kills them all. What just happened? The soldiers had been operating under the old system that every person is accountable to God to follow the law. And uh, they said the law says there's only that you need two or more witnesses before you condemn somebody to death. There's only one witness, mm -hmm. Doeg. And so they're like, this does not compute. You're telling me to kill. There's only one witness. There should be two. The law says, and I'm accountable to God personally. They're hesitating. They still have a conscience. Doeg the Edomite says, yeah. King, I'm going to surrender my conscience to you. You tell me to kill, I'll kill. You tell me to kill the baby in the womb, I'll kill it. You tell me there's no mm -hmm. more male and female, fine. You tell me I can do you know, transgender this, that, and the other, fine, anything. I'm just a bunch of mush. You blow your trumpets, I'll bow to your statue. The, the tyrant always wants to it's insert itself between you and God. It wants to dictate your, it wants to have, force you to give up your conscience. If you have a conscience uh, that says that you don't want to get something injected into your body, the government says, we don't care what your conscience is. You do what we tell you to do, right? And so, um, right. so we go, um, this again, this pilgrim, uh, 
uh, Puritans have a covenant form of government. You get rights and blessings from God. You take care of your neighbor because you're accountable to God. Um, now, that was the pilgrims. Uh, after a century after them, you have covenant turned into social contract during the Age of Enlightenment. Uh -huh. And this comes out of the mm -hmm. scientific revolution where Sir Francis Bacon uh, and sort of, you know, they come up with all these laws and Isaac Newton has laws of motion and uh, Kepler has laws of planetary motion and Robert Boyle mm -hmm. has laws of pressure. And so some theologian says, well, maybe God, had, God made everything with laws. And like a guy makes a mm -hmm. clock and winds it up and sets it on a shelf and it goes for a walk. Yeah, God made everything, but he's, he's not involved. Uh, he's a distant God. He's impersonal. He's far away. So we go from pilgrim covenant with a personal God to a social contract, which is with an impersonal distant God. And instead of being committed to take care of your neighbor, it's just an agreement with your neighbor. And so it's a little bit distant from God, but a little bit distant from your neighbor. Well, the century after the Age of Enlightenment is the French Revolution with social contract with no God. You get your rights from the group, you're accountable to the group. And the century after that, you have Marxism and socialism where the state is God. You get your rights from the state, you're accountable to the state. And if the state thinks you're not pulling your weight, it can kill you. So the French Revolution, uh, it's an, um, we see how they helped us during our revolution and they got nothing in return for helping us other than debt. And then they had a couple years where their crops failed and the people said, um, if we can you remember, they went to Queen Marie Antoinette and says, the people don't have bread. And uh, Rousseau said mm -hmm. that she said, oh, let them eat cake, right? Um, yes. Anyway, so, so the people said, if they could just chop off the king and queen's heads, all their problems will be solved. So they mm -hmm. chop off King Louis the 16th, Marie Antoinette. And then they, nothing gets better. So they chop off the heads of all the royalty. Doesn't get any better. They chop off the heads of all the wealthy. You have money, we don't. You must have got it by stealing. Um, then they chop off the heads of the businessmen and farmers. You got food and supplies, we don't. You're selfish. Then they chop off the heads of the hoarders. You got extra food and we don't have enough. You're selfish. Then they chop off the heads of the clergy because they're speaking out against all the head chopping off stuff. Then they chop off the heads of the former revolutionaries, the ones that used to chop off heads, but got tired of it, somehow they're to blame. 30,000 people had their heads chopped off in Paris, France. They were chopping off so many heads, they invented a, a machine to do it nice and clean called the guillotine. Mm -hmm. And the motto of the French Revolution was liberty, equality, fraternity. Sounds nice, but it doesn't work. Liberty mm -hmm. is always experienced individually, but fraternity is the collective. It's their word for socialism, right? Yeah. It's the social contract, the state, the mob, and equality can be understood two ways. In America, it was equal treatment before the law. In France, yes. it was everyone having an equal amount of stuff. And if mm -hmm. the fraternity, the group, the collective, the social contracts state thinks you have too much stuff, it can trample on your individual liberty and take away all your individual stuff and redistribute it and even kill you. And yeah. so during this time, the president of Yale, Timothy Dwight, gives an address, the duty of Americans at this present crisis. And he says, about the year 1728, Voltaire, so celebrated for his wit and his hatred of Christianity, formed a systematical design to destroy Christianity and to introduce in its stead a general diffusion of irreligion and atheism. The being of God was denied and ridiculed. Possession of property was pronounced robbery, right? You got property. You must have gotten it by taking it from people. Um, chastity and natural affection were declared to be nothing more than groundless prejudices. Remember mm. the um, J.D. Unwin, right? Uh, yeah. Saying sexual promiscuity. And then um, with ancient Israel, with those sodomites banging on the doors, it says adultery, assassination, poisonings, and crimes of other like infernal nature were taught as lawful provided the end was good. Mm -hmm. So if you think that your end is good, it's okay for you to destroy people's stores and businesses downtown and smash windows. And even if they're innocent, if you think your end is good, you can do anything. The education right. of youth books are replete with infidelity, irreligion, immorality, and obscenity. Sort of like the textbooks they're using in schools nowadays. Yes. Um, but again, 
we got Plato saying, oh, you got to take these youth away from their, their parents and indoctrinate them. And, and God chose Abraham because he would teach his children after him. So the battle is who gets to teach the youth? To destroy us, therefore, our enemies must first destroy our Sabbath and seduce us from the house of God. So what happened in France? They had a reign of terror. And they're just this mob, just just picking people and killing them. And so they tore down statues, like good King Henry IV. He was the Mm -hmm. king that tried to patch up Protestants and Catholics. And then they dug up the bones of St. Genevieve. So in 450 AD, Attila the Hun is scourging Europe with half a million soldiers, destroying cities of Strasbourg, Worms, Mainz, Cologne, Tier, Metz, and he's headed toward Paris. And Genevieve, the young woman, gets all of Paris to fast and pray. And for some reason, Attila skips second Paris. And so she's considered the patron saint of Paris. Well, during the French Revolution, they dig up St. Genevieve's bones and trash them. Why would you want to destroy history? It's a concept called deconstruction, where you want to separate people from their past, get them into a neutral where they don't remember where they came from, and then you brainwash them into the future you have planned for them. It's a drive neutral reverse. It's uh, like a toothpaste salesman. The first thing that they do is tell you negative things about the toothpaste you're currently using. You're still brushing with that stuff. Don't you realize it'll eat the enamel off your teeth? And then you're repulsed by it, and you're in a neutral position. You're open-minded. What are all the toothpaste out there? And then they give you the pitch for the brand new tartar controlled breast freshener toothpaste. So it's a drive new to reverse. It's a gene replacement therapy for culture. Take out the old DNA, put in the new. And so they want to go into the classrooms and tell the kids negative things about the founding fathers. They took land from Indians. They sold people into slavery. They were chauvinists who the students are repulsed by them. Now you got the students into a neutral open-minded position, and then you give them your pitch for socialism or LGBT or Sharia Islam. And we see this happen in Europe with the French Revolution. Went from a thousand years of Catholic cathedrals, Protestant Reformation and Jewish neighborhoods to a secular Europe and free sex, anything goes, right? Sort of like John Lennon's, imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you tried. And, um, but if there's no heaven, there's no God, uh, then there's no absolute right and wrong. And it's just, uh, you give into your lusts and it turns into chaos and then, now Europe's turning into a Sharia socialist Europe with Mohammed being the number one name for newborns and, and uh, the government controlling everyone, deciding everyone's careers. But it also happened in China, this destroying of history. And the third century BC is called the Warring States period. And you had a half a dozen kingdoms fighting and one wins led by Qin Shi Huangdi. And he's considered the uni- first unifier of China. And Qin Shi Huangdi was being criticized for doing things differently than they had been done for centuries before. And he got tired of being criticized. So he decided to destroy all records of how things were done before. And so he had them burn tens of thousands of bamboo animal books. They wrote on strips of bamboo from top to bottom, and they wove them together. Well, he had them all burnt. And so his uh, chancellor was Li Si, who wrote in 213 BC, I, your servant, propose that all historians' records other than Quinn's be burned. If anyone under heaven has copies of the classics of history, they shall deliver them to the governor for burning. Anyone who dares discuss the classics of history shall be publicly executed. Anyone who uses history to criticize the present shall have his family executed and anyone who has failed to burn the books after 30 days of this announcement shall be sent to build a great wall. And so this was what Mao Zedong copied during the 1960s Cultural Revolution, where he destroyed the oldest Buddhist temple in China and the great gates of Beijing. And they did white shaming, right? Anybody that was trained in Western medicine or law or, or a teacher, they'd bring them into a public place and have them confess their whiteness. And they would yeah. cut them and they'd get bleed. And the more blood that they got on the, these young kids, the more that they felt like they were, you know, excited Antifa BLM rioters, you know. And then they just destroyed this heritage. And uh, this is a Breitbart article, uh, just a couple of months old. Paris was going to have an exhibition on Genghis Khan, who was a Mongolian who conquered China and ruled it for a century called the Wan Dynasty. But the Chinese consider this an embarrassment that a Mongolian ruled them for a century. 
And so uh, Xi Jinping, the head of China, told Paris to stop their exhibition. And then they're defacing Genghis Khan memorials and monuments and statues all around China. So it's not just tearing down history over here, it's tearing it down over there. Pol Pot did the same thing in Cambodia with the Khmer Rouge. He decided that 1975 was the new year zero. Anything prior to that was irrelevant. And he killed anybody that wore glasses. If you wore glasses, you could read. And if you read, you knew the history. And he wanted to get rid of history. And Islam does this. Whenever they come into a country, they destroy history. Uh, when Amir ibn al-As invaded Egypt and came to the great library at Alexandria, which was the oldest library in the world, sent a message to Khalif Umar what to do with all these books. And he said, every book that does not agree with the Quran destroyed. And every book that does agree with the Quran is redundant because we have the Quran. So destroy them all. Supposedly it took six months to burn them all. And they're still doing it today. When the ISIS got control of Mosul, Iraq, they destroyed the museum of the great Assyrian empire, which in 700 BC was the most powerful empire on planet earth. But why would you want to destroy something that was from 700 BC, right? Now it's called the 1619 Project or Howard Zinn's People's History of the United States. Its whole purpose is to say negative things about the past so that people emotionally detach from them. Then you get the people into a neutral where they don't have a memory of where they came from. And then you brainwash them into the socialist future you have planned for them. Carl Sandburg said, when a nation goes down, one condition may always be found. They forgot where they came from. And um, George Orwell in his 1984 book has a character named Winston who worked for the Ministry of Truth, and uh, which was nothing but lies, but his job was editing history and putting all evidence of the real history down the memory hole, down this pneumatic tube. And so um, he wrote this in 1948. And so pneumatic tubes, you know, when you go to the bank and you put your deposit and it sucks it up, right? That was a new invention. And so in this book, he would have this uh, capsule with the, the, the history he's supposed to edit and he would you know, change it. And then he'd take all the old history and stick it in a pneumatic tube where it sucked down into the uh, basement and burnt in an incinerator. And so he says, every record has been destroyed or falsified. Every book rewritten. Every picture has been repainted. Every statue and street building has been renamed. Every date has been altered. History has stopped. Nothing exists except an endless present, which the party is always right. I know, of course, that the past is falsified. But it would never be possible for me to prove it, even when I did the falsification myself. After the thing is done, no evidence remains. The only evidence is inside my own mind. And I don't know if any other human being shares my memories. Everything yeah. faded into mist. The past was erased. The erasure was forgotten. The lie, the lies became truth. Or we'll said those no. control... Yeah, I was going to say that uh, I know you have a hard deadline and uh, uh, we can let's try to wrap it up if we could. It's been fascinating, a tremendous amount of information. But if you'd like to wrap it up for us for a couple of moments, uh, and then we'll sign off. Yeah, yeah. And I've, I've only gotten a portion of the way through it. So I'm, I'm happy to right. come back at any time in the future to, oh, yes. to pick up and, and, we'll have and you go back on. for sure. But um, George Orwell said, those who control the past control the future, but those who control the present control the past. So if you control the present, you get to decide what's in the history books about the past. And people draw their identity and their trajectory in life from where they came from. So the French Revolution, they erase the Judeo-Christian history, destroy monuments, desecrate graves, and so forth. Churches closed. And um, they even kill the nuns. So these Sisters mm -hmm. of Charity were the ones that had started hospitals and they staffed hospitals and they were, it was synonymous. A nun was synonymous with nurse. Matter of fact, the nurse's hat came from the nun's habit and they, uh, but the French revolution was forcing them to give up their conscience and they wouldn't. And so they marched into the guillotine and chopped, chopped their heads off. And could you imagine the government sort of like Obama suing the little sisters of the poor because they wouldn't mm -hmm. support abortions. And here they were taking vows of chastity, yet they had to support abortions and they had to go twice to the Supreme Court of the United States. And um, yeah. 
And so here, these mm-hmm. nuns in France, they, they marched them up to the guillotine and chopped off their heads. And they're singing their songs. There's one less person singing, one less person singing until nobody else is singing. And uh, Robespierre yeah. was the head of their Homeland Security. He says, he gave an address called Terror Justified. Lead the people by terror. Mm-hmm. Basis of popular government during the revolution is terror. Terror is nothing more than swift, severe, inflexible justice. So in other words, he's saying that when you're going to do this new socialist system, you have to have the government terrorize its own people to get them into fear so they will panic and give up their freedoms to the government. Could you imagine the government orchestrating terror on its own people? Anyway. What's amazing too, uh, Bill, about the word, he, he used the word justice, Rose Pierre quoting and using the word justice. And we know that the Bible uh, defines justice as righteousness. And it's an attribute of God as part of his nature. And he talked about in the scriptures that for those who are in positions of power, judging that they needed to do so righteously, meaning that they had to do so. That was real justice is, is uh, identifying and um, showing, demonstrating justice. And source, of course, we've seen how that word has been misused today with the social justice advocates. We have them here in New Jersey, which really has to do with redistribution and, un- and treating others differently, um, as opposed to not equating or, or applying the law equally to everyone, but giving special rights and privileges to some at the expense of, of others. So again, we see how Rose Pierre's uses of justice is also very similar to the way justice has been um, misinterpreted and misapplied um, today in New Jersey. And Bill, what's amazing is, is about, we've just scratched the surface with this presentation. We'll have you back to, to finish it up, but uh, you're going to want to get the book because the book, the book has, has uh, much more um, proof and evidence uh, for this presentation that Bill's given. There it is. You're going to want to order this book, Socialism and the Real History from Plato to the Present. What's amazing, Bill, is what you're doing uh, with the book is just showing that there's a historical precedent um, given for everything that we're seeing in this country today, whether it's the the lack of morality, um, the rise of promiscuity. A lot of this came about in the 60s is where it really started to become prevalent and the educating uh, the state, wanting to educate our children, supporting ideas that are against the laws of nature and nature's God. Um, the idea that um, we gradually, human nature wants to uh, move away from God, move away from the law of God, and then it turns into chaos and turns into the reign of terror. Um, and that's exactly where we're headed in the state of New Jersey in the country today. And this book is an excellent example of providing the historical precedent by which all of these injustices occur. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to be on to talk about it a little bit. And uh, again, there's lots more there. Be happy to be on again to, to finish up. Yes. Uh, if somebody does want the book, they can go to our website, AmericanMinute.com, AmericanMinute.com. And I also That's they can right. sign up. They can and sign I'll up for a date, that link. email. All right. I'll provide, the, I'll provide the link, Bill. I want to thank you so much again for joining me. Um, if I don't talk to you before, have a Merry Christmas and uh, God bless you and your family and a Happy New Year. But we will definitely want to set up a conclusion uh, to this uh, presentation. and We'll look to do that in the new year. Thank all you right. so much, Bill, and for all the great writing and all the great teaching that you do. Well, thank you, Jr., and blessings to all the viewers and listeners. Thank you. And to all the audience, uh, please share this video, like it, uh, let other people know about it. It's been very, very informative. You're going to watch it, want to watch this, and also get the book uh, that Bill had written, Socialism, the True History, the Real History of Pla- from Plato to the Present, and how the deep state capitalizes on crisis that consolidate control. And the citizens of New Jersey can relate with that, and how Phil Murphy has capitalized on crisis to implement tyranny and control in the citizens of New Jersey. But thank you very much, Bill. Thank you, our audience. And remember what Lincoln said, liberty to all. Thank you.